All right, if you've got a Bible tonight, if you have a Bible, I'd like for you to open up over to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. As you know, on Wednesday nights, we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew. Last week, we talked on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And we covered that topic, and, and, and I encourage you to listen to that message if you haven't already, because I think it'll help some people that really struggle with um, the whole concept of remarriage after a divorce. And then Jesus immediately goes out of talking about divorce, and he talks about those that are the most impacted by divorce, and he immediately starts talking about children. And the scripture says here in verse number 13, then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them, and Jesus said, Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And when he had placed his hands on them, they went on from there. So here we see this portion of scripture that I've referred to many times about Jesus when he laid his hands upon children. Jesus had a children's ministry. A couple of things I want you to see in this passage of scripture both of the times of ministry that are going to take place here in this chapter, this chapter going forward, the, the little children that came to Jesus as well as the young rich ruler, ministry usually comes to us the same way it came to Jesus. It came in the way of an interruption. We've got to realize that a lot of times we have interruptions in life and we kind of are trying to avoid the interruptions, but most ministry in the life of Jesus came in the way of an interruption. Zacchaeus calling out to the Lord, blind Bartimaeus calling out to the Lord, the lady with the issue of blood that pushed through the crowd to touch the hem of his garment. Most of the ministry of Jesus came in the way of an interruption. So what we can do, if we're not careful, is we can get so rigid and we can have such a, a mindset and a predetermination of how we think the day needs to go that God really is bringing opportunities our way, and we're not seeing the opportunities. We're not seizing the opportunity. How I many know you can't really seize it if you're not seeing it? And so in the case of Jesus, this ministry to children was a divine interruption. It was an interruption. Now, I understand that not all interruptions are divine interruptions. I get that. But what I want to encourage you to do, the next time you're really exasperated, the next time you're frustrated about something, because I had something planned today, and then this person stopped me. You know, you need to stop and slow down and say, Lord, is this you? Is this you working here in this situation? Well, we were on vacation in Galveston. I was reading a book there, and it really helped me a lot. It was a pastor, and he had pastored for many years, and then he had served in different capacities within his denomination. And that's what his summarization of ministry after all these years of ministry, most of my ministry came in the way of interruptions. And I've learned to kind of recognize that and be aware of it. So here Jesus is out and about and children are brought to him. And the children are brought to him and Jesus places his hands upon them and he prays for them. And the disciples rebuke him. So though you're close to the Lord and though you love the Lord, uh, unfortunately even the best, Jesus' best, they missed it. They kind of thought that they could tell We've been with Jesus for a while here. We know that he's not going to like this going on. But what they thought was totally opposite of what Jesus thought. And the scripture tells us to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And the scripture also tells us that our thoughts are not God's thoughts. And in this case, their natural thoughts were, let's get these kids out of here. Jesus has an important ministry. But part of Jesus' ministry was to children. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Over in Matthew's gospel, we see as we're going through here, the ninth chapter, the 10th chapter, the 15th chapter, the 17th chapter, the 18th chapter, the 19th chapter, and the 21st chapter all make reference to Jesus ministering to children. So a church needs to realize the importance of us reaching out to children. They weren't a nuisance. They weren't something that needed to be kind of get them out of here but no let's bless them and let's do what we can to minister to them so Jesus laid his hands on them we know in the Old Testament that the patriarchs would lay hands on their children and through the laying on of hands a blessing was conferred when you lay hands on a person and you do it 
in the name of the Lord, there is a blessing. There is a conference. There is a, um, you know, a, something powerful that happens through the laying on of hands. And so think about that. And then also we think about ordaining leaders in the, in, throughout the Old Testament and New Testament. You'll see that they laid hands upon people for the ordination of leaders. I believe that's what was going on here. Jesus is laying hands on some future generation leaders, blessing some leaders that were going to be going forth. And then, of course, in the ministry of Jesus, how many times did he touch and through the laying on of hands, healing flowed out of the contact, the law of contact and transmission when there was a flow of the Spirit of God that took place through the laying on of hands. And, uh, you know, I... I know that we can pray with somebody on the phone the lord can hear that prayer i realize that we can uh, just get an agreement but there is something about laying hands on a person and speaking god's word over them and believing for the power of god to flow into their lives god honors that and then throughout the book of acts we see about the ministry of the holy spirit that time and time again of the five different times in the book of acts when people were filled with the spirit three of the five there was through the laying on of hands. That's not the only way, but it was one way that the Holy Spirit can be ministered into a person's life. So for Jesus, these kids, they weren't a problem. They were actually refreshing because he had been dealing with all of these people that were so stubborn and resistant, and then all of a sudden they had these children run, and they're just talking, and they're receiving, and and, and they're, they're just like children are. They're, they're, they, they receive well, and they're listening to him and we think of characteristics of children they're trusting they're dependent they're innocent they have a desire to please they're vulnerable Um, you know we call them dependents don't we around tax time how many dependents do you have Uh, and that's a good picture of what they are they are depending on us and and our children's eternity is depending on us and it's important that we have the proper values and, uh, and it's important as parents that we realize that we're reproducing ourselves, not just in terms of their natural life, their birth, but their values are being reproduced and how they think about things. And, you know, every once in a while we're driving down the road and one of my kids will say something and Sharon will look over at me and she'll say, I wonder where he got that. You know? And I'm going, okay, I know where he got it. Got it from me. So uh, they're listening. Can I get a good amen here? So what you say, they're going to repeat. So we're to be childlike, but not childish. We're to have simple, pure faith, a sincere heart, a reliance upon the Lord. Now, Jesus never said that the children, you need to become like adults in order to be saved. But he did tell adults, you need to become like children to be saved. And we need to be quick to just trust the Lord. And uh, children are forgiving children um you know they're trusting um you know i i tease our kids you know how i'll say things and it's amazing how gullible they can be about stuff you know everything from you know looking outside at the moon and saying hey you can see the flag up there you know and you know and they kind of go along with it for a while then they learn you but uh so what i want to say is is children hey y'all children are our future but they're not just our future, they're our present. We need to minister to them and love them. And You know, God didn't give you kids to be miserable. He gave you kids to enjoy them. I mean, uh, you know, Deuteronomy 28 said, this is one of the blessings that will come on you. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy womb. Your kids are a blessing. Our children are a blessing. And we just need to, you know, enjoy them. And I think some people are so fast-tracking trying to, Wait, can't wait to empty nest, can't wait till they get out of here, can't wait for that, can't wait for that. Really? Is that the attitude? Because I promise you, when you're empty nest, you're going to have that same miserable spirits working in your life, wanting something else. we got to enjoy the journey right now. Give me a good amen. Well, then we have a man that comes to the Lord, and he's the young, rich man. Now, this account is referred to, in three of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, all make reference to a young rich man, a young rich ruler. Um, You know, the accounts are a little bit different, but it's the same account of a young man that comes to the Lord. Now, when I say young, I read today this word young in the Greek typically referred to a person about 21 to 28 years of age, a person that's really making a lot of decisions. 
and he's coming to the Lord. A ruler, what kind of, if you're a ruler, what do you rule? Some believe that he was a ruler of a synagogue. So he was a spiritually um, astute person. He was interested in spiritual things. And he comes to the Lord. And this is a very interesting exchange that goes on here. Now, a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones? The man uh, inquired. Jesus replied, Well, do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. uh, And love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus talks about uh, the Ten Commandments here. And then he finishes up quoting from Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself. I think it's interesting. I'm just going to, some of this I, I teach just devotionally. I've always, when I've read this passage, Jesus talks to a 21-year-old to a 28-year-old person, and he reiterates, you need to honor your father and mother. You don't time out on that one. Now, you honor them different at 21 to 28 than you did from 0 to 8, or 8 to 16, or 8 to 18. And, but nonetheless, there is, there is, you know, as a young child, there's through obedience you honor your parents. But as, as your parents get older, by being considerate of them and, 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 and being concerned about your aging parents, Jesus spoke to a 20-something and told him, part of the commandments is, young man, you need to be honoring your parents. You haven't timed out on that one. You need to be faithful in that area. And so, you know, this young man, he's, I believe he's sincere. I don't think he's... Uh, I know a lot of people came to Jesus and there was kind of trickery or they were out to deceive him or they were out to uh, catch him in his own words. But you kind of sense there's a sincerity about this young man. And he says, all these have I kept, the young man said. What do I still like? But there's something missing in my life. One of the greatest ways that we can present the gospel to people is that people without Jesus... They may have a lot going on externally, but deep in their heart, they know something is missing. There's an emptiness, there's a void, there's something that's absent in their life. And typically once a year, I will speak to the UConn high school uh, football team right here in the sanctuary, and and I'll, you know, present the gospel to them. And I got these notes from Billy Graham, and I usually will go through these notes that I keep in my Bible. And... uh, and, and these are some things that Billy Graham and Franklin Graham, this is kind of a combination of the two of them. And Franklin Graham has said this, sooner or later, every thinking person will ask themselves, what is the meaning of life? Why am I on earth? Why do I exist? Is there life after death? They realize that there are deep spiritual needs that are not being met with material things. People, sooner or later, know something is lacking. They realize these material things aren't meeting an inner need in my life. Have you ever been excited about buying something, you know, like a television or a car or something, and you're really excited about it, then after you bought it, you thought, well, it's okay. I mean, I'm glad we got it, but it's not all that I thought it would be. Well, that's the whole world. They're, they're trying to, let's, let, let's go to this game or let's go to this event or let's go to this concert or let's go there or there. But when they leave those places, there's still something missing in their life. There's a feeling of emptiness, a restlessness, a dissatisfaction in people's lives. People experience loneliness. They have a feeling of guilt, a fear of death. They question what is the true meaning of life. There's an inner void in their life. Everybody that doesn't know Jesus all of that fits in their life. And so one of the greatest thoughts is when you talk to people, there's a lot of people that are doing a lot of good things, but they know something is still missing in my life. And I want to tell you, I can truthfully say this with all my heart, when you know Jesus, there's nothing missing in your life. (laughs) Now, I need to dig deeper, and there's times I need to stir up the gift of God, and I need to get into the Word more, and I need to you know, press in in the spirit. But I don't have this sense that, oh, I've got this huge void. I know I am complete in Christ. The search is over. Can I get a good amen? And I sincerely mean that. You know, I know that I, I know that he fills us. We are complete in him. Verse 21, Jesus answered, if you want 
to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. So the Lord here doesn't give a standard. This isn't the standard formula for salvation. In other words, Romans 10, 9, and 10 doesn't say, if thou shalt confess with your mouth and believe in your heart and sell everything you have, thou shalt be saved. You understand that? So this isn't a, uh, just a standard answer. For example, Zacchaeus was the person of wealth, and he came to the Lord. He voluntarily surrendered things, but he really wasn't surrendering wealth as much as he was just making it right, meaning you know he had stolen and uh, gotten his money in a dishonest way, and he was just setting it right. So this man's coming to the Lord. He's talking about, you know, I am, I'm not committing a, a adultery. I'm not stealing. I, I'm not bearing false testimony. I'm, I'm trying to honor my parents, but yet I'm conscious that there's something missing in my life. And then Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Now, Jesus keyed in on what was going on in this man's life. Jesus did make reference to covetousness here, but certainly that's one of those commandments. And, and there is, evidently working in his life, there was this covetous desire, this idolatry. And, and wealth can become an idol to us. It doesn't have to be. Sometimes it matters how you got the wealth. If you got it on your own without the conscious awareness that God helped me God gave me the power to get wealth, and the blessing of the Lord made me rich, and, and it adds no sorrow. Those people are a lot easier to share that and to be a blessing to other people. But people that kind of have the attitude, wait a minute, that's mine. I earned that. I got that. I did this. And I realized that through their own hard work, they may have um, earned those things. But you understand that God still gives us the grace for whatever I have. Can I get a good amen here? You know, everybody in this room is talented in different areas. But, you know, uh, all of us have gifts. But even with the gift that God has given us, that doesn't leave room for arrogance, correct? With whatever you have, you can't become kind of arrogant with that. But we need to use that gift to honor the Lord and to serve the Lord in those ways and to be a blessing to him. Well, what happened? Jesus told him, if you want to have treasure in heaven, come, then come follow me. If you'll do this, you can have treasure in heaven. Isn't it interesting that Jesus made a direct association? What you do with your treasure on earth has everything to do with how much treasure you have in heaven. In other words, what I do with the money I have on this earth has everything to do with the treasure I have in heaven. Then come follow me. So this, this, this young man's hearing all this, and, and, and his mind's kind of going tilt. Now, wait a minute here. You want me to sell everything? Then the young man heard this. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Now, do you think he would have gone away sad had he went ahead and obeyed the Lord? I don't think the Lord requires this of everybody, that you sell everything you have. But I'll promise you this. If you follow the Lord long enough, eventually Jesus, the head of the church, will talk to you about some area of your life that you need to give to him. Eventually, there will be something you need to give up in order to grow up. It doesn't mean your salvation hinges on that, but there are going to be certain things that you know intuitively, I need to let go of that. In order for me to grow up, I need to let go of that. Now, this man comes to the Lord with a good question. What can I do to get eternal life? Now, I know the way he worded it in the best way. In other words, I need to do something. How do I work my way into eternal life? We aren't saved because of works. But when you are saved, you are saved in that salvation will bring about good works. You are Christ's workmanship. You know, we were created for good works. So they're the fruit and not the root. I'm not saved because of what I do, but because I am saved, there is fruit in my life. And that's a national by, natural byproduct of that. So it is an obedient faith. We're not saved. You realize somebody could go out and have a garage sale and sell everything they've owned. It's more than that. You've got to be born again. 
Now, this man, there was not a death, burial, and resurrection for this man to confess and believe in, but he could have a faith in Jesus, and his sins could have been atoned for in that day. Well, so in this case, obedience is simply living a life of obedience, or obedience is simply living a life in compliance with the Word of God. If money becomes an idol, we've got to abandon it. Anything that becomes an idol, correct? Anything that you just, ah, I, I, I tell you, if I don't watch that show every week, I, I'm, just, I'm just all out of sorts. Well, you need to put the show on the altar. Can I get a good amen here? Well, if I, I, don't, if I tell you what, I got to, I got to, well, I got to, got to, got to. Anything that you just have that, you just need to realize, hey, it's okay. You just, that's becoming too big there, and you need to just be able to give that to the Lord. Romans 3 and 20 says, Therefore, no man will be declared righteous in the sight of God by observing a law. Rather, uh, the law has made us conscious of sin. Why do we have the law? The law, through the law, we are become conscious of sin. So the law never saved anybody. Best way to describe the law. The law is kind of like an MRI. MRI. Nobody said, hey, how you doing? I got an MRI and I got healed today. You got healed with that MRI? Yeah, that MRI healed me. No, the MRI didn't heal you. The MRI just exposed the problem. Correct? Then something else heals you. So the law was given to expose, the, help you to see your true condition, and then it would bring you to Christ. Another example of the law, the law is like an alarm clock. The l- alarm clock might wake you up, but the alarm clock doesn't grab you out of the bed and pull you up on the floor. And the law was given to wake us up, but it wasn't given to raise us up. Christ has been given to raise us up, to lift us up, and seat us with God and Christ in heavenly places. So what we need to realize here is, is that even if this man had sold everything, even if he had obeyed all the commandments, that in and of itself is not enough. And, and that's important because if... When the man came to Jesus, and uh, or came to Paul, rather, in Acts 16, the Philippian jailer, and he specifically said, what must I do to be saved? That's about as straightforward as you can get. And what, did his re- what was his response? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, and your family will be saved. So the idea here is is that believing faith is what produces salvation in our life. Though I believe in repentance, and I believe that when I do have sincere faith, faith alone saves us, but faith that saves us is never alone. I think it was Luther that said that. So, you know, it's it's alone we're saved through faith, but then there's a natural byproduct of, of faith as a result of that. Can I get a good amen here? Well, this man's going away sad, for he had a lot of money. He was sad. Remember what Paul said in 1 Timothy 6, 17. It says, command those who are rich in this present world that they're not arrogant, that they, the world, not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds and to be generous willing to share in this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may hold they may take hold of life that is truly life so he warns us if we have money not to be arrogant or to put hope in that but to be willing to give it now most of you read that scripture and go well that's not talking about me pastor because see i'm not wealthy but you know if i had a fellow from haiti come over and visit your house you know what he would say he said oh my lord you're the wealthiest person i've ever met in my life if i had somebody from central america parts of south america actually i'm just gonna go ahead and put it this way from pretty much any country in the world if they came here you know what they'd say they'd say wow y'all got two cars you got a garage and you keep nothing but junk in there? This isn't the word of knowledge. This is just. 
<laughs> you know what? I, I want you to know something that, that you read this passage and you think, oh, yeah, charge them that are rich in this world to be not high-minded. But you know how the most arrogant people in the world are? Americans. It's like somebody from a Scandinavian country came up and said, hey, what, what are the, I think it's from Finland or something, what do the people in the United States think about us people in Finland? And the guy said, man, I hate to tell you this, but they're not thinking about you, you know. It, 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 you know, there's this arrogance. But, but you know, what we've got to realize is, is that we're 4% of the world's population. And... Uh, I tell you, if America doesn't repent, America's best days are in the rearview mirror. Now, you say, Pastor, is that a prophet of doom? That's just reality. To whomsoever much is given, much shall be what? And have we been given a lot? Have we been given a lot? Now, I understand, hear this, I understand there's a remnant in this land, and I'm part of that remnant, and you are as well. I understand that God said he would spare the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah with ten righteous people. I get that. But what I'm still saying is for all of us, the things that made America strong wasn't because God loved old glory. The thing that made America strong is not that God just kind of thinks, you know, that red, white, and blue. Uh, he doesn't, just because he likes the song, God Bless the USA, that's not what he likes about America. Now, I received this today. This is the Founder's Bible and the Origin of Dream of Freedom. And it's a Bible that tells a lot about our country's history, a lot about America. And I was just curious whenever I got this Bible, I was thinking to myself, I wonder if it has anything about this 19th chapter, for example, this 19th chapter. And sure enough, I go over there, and it brings out, uh, in 1844, a case reached the United States Supreme Court in, involving the estate of a Frenchman named Stephen Gerard who had arrived in the United States before the Declaration of Independence. He settled in Philadelphia and lived there until his death in 1831. When he bequeathed his estate, a value, his whole estate was worth over $7 million, and that was a lot of money back then, okay, to the city of Philadelphia. He, he you know, donated it to the city with the condition that it would construct Four orphans between the ages of six and 18, a college to be named after him in which he specifically stipulated. Now, here you have a man who donated $7 million, a Frenchman, and he did this, 1831 at the time of his death. He donated this. But here's the stipulation. I enjoin and I require that no ecclesiastic, it means like clergy, evangelical would probably be the term today, church. It's a picture of church. Missionary or minister or any sect, denomination whatsoever shall ever hold or exercise any station or duty whatever in that said college, nor shall any such person ever be admitted for any purpose. So don't ever let a preacher on the campus. Don't let ever a missionary on the campus Anybody from any denomination, do not let them in that building for any purpose or as a visitor within the premises. In other words, I'm going to donate this money. I want you to build a facility for orphans aged 6 to 18, but there are a few requirements, and that is one is I don't want any gospel light whatsoever. Okay. Well, his heirs, seeking to keep his estate in their hands, filed suit against the will and secured the great Daniel Webster, a defender of the Constitution, as their lawyer. Webster was considered the greatest attorney in his generation and personally argued and won numerous cases before the United States Supreme Court. In fact, it is reported that opposing attorneys, when learning that they were facing Webster, would sometimes withdraw from the case rather than face his genius. The requirement to exclude clergy in religious teaching from a school to be established under the government's authority was unprecedented. When Webster addressed the Supreme Court from what others might have uh, been nothing more than a dry legal argument, from his lips became an emotional appeal of an 
the importance of preserving religious instruction at the school. His argument began, or his argument before the court lasted three days, throughout which time he repeatedly attacked the school for its anti Christian posture, telling the court the plan of education proposed by Mr. Gerard is derogatory to the Christian religion, tends to weaken men's reverence for that religion and their conviction in its authority and importance. Therefore, in its general character, tends to be mischievous and not. Uh, to useful ends. The proposed school is to be founded on plain and clear principles for the plain and clear objections of infidelity. When little children were bought, now listen to this, when little children were bought into the presence of the Son of God, his disciples proposed to send them away, but he said, suffer the little children to come unto me, unto me. He opened at once to the youthful mind, the everlasting foundation of living waters, the only source of eternal truths. Suffer the little children to come unto me. Now listen to this. And that injunction is a perpetual obligation. This man is trying to stop. He's trying to do exactly what the disciples did, and he forbid them to do it, and this man's trying to do it. We've got to obey Jesus. Do you think this would win before the Supreme Court today, you know? In addressing itself today with the same earnestness, this goes on to say, and it addresses itself today in the same earnestness and the same authority which attended its first utterance to the Christian world. And I don't know that I'll read everything verbatim, but nonetheless, he presented his case about suffer the little children to come unto me, and it's not right for him to try to prevent these children to hear the gospel. Webster opposed any plan of education that forbade children to come unto the Lord at school. Significantly, the city's attorney agreed that religion must be taught at the school, telling the court the purest principles of morality are to be taught. Where are they found? Whoever searches for them must go to the source for which Christian man derives his faith, the Bible. There is an obligation to teach in the school what the Bible alone can teach, a system of morality. After arguments were finished, the unanimous opinion of the Supreme Court was delivered by Justice Joseph Story, a father of American Jewish American jurisprudence, who had been placed on the court by President James Madison. The court ruled that Christianity could not be excluded from that school. You know, uh, y'all, that that is what gives us a picture. And it goes on to give more information about this. But that's what caused our country to be a wonderful country. Can I get a good amen? And so uh, it, it just reiterates that, um, you know, we have a great heritage here. And um, thank God. And God still raises up attorneys that can speak the truth, right? And, um, and I am thankful for Brent Olson. Brent Olson represents people I number of years ago there's been people in this room that have benefited from him but I can remember uh, a number of years ago there was an issue in one of the public schools right around here and Brent said hey you want to go with me I'm going to be speaking before the school superintendent there's a school board meeting and I need to go there and and so this was several years ago so we're driving to this school board meeting and it's a cold winter night and we drive up and he goes, can you hold the poster boards for me? I go, no problem, man. I, I can hold poster boards, you know. Man, Brent got up there, and he started talking in front of that whole school board, and he started talking to them about they were denying kids the opportunity to sing Christmas songs during Christmas time, and he was going on and on and on. And I was holding the boards, and you should have seen that superintendent's face drop every time Brent started. And then he started reading emails. You shouldn't be sending emails out, and he was talking. I tell you what, I, I said, Brent, next time you do that, give me a little heads up, man. I didn't know I was walking into crossfire like that, you know. But anyway, I, I don't want to get off my main focus here, but think about it. As Americans, we are blessed. We are blessed in so many ways. That we are the envy of the world. Now, I hope that on Sunday we're able to have one of our missionaries that ministers in many Islamic countries the only way, I talked to her today, and she said, the only way, for example, in Somalia, there are no identifiable believers 
we don't, we, you know, so the only way we can get into those countries is the favor that God has put on the English language because people want to learn English. And she is completing her paper for her PhD, and she said, you know, it's amazing. People, they may not want the gospel, but you're able to get in through teaching of English, and then through that, as believers, we're permitted to bring our Bible, and it's just a door opener. So God has blessed us as Americans. He's blessed our language, but we are blessed so that, why? We can be a blessing to the world. So I know when you read the story of the young rich ruler, you're going, Pastor, you know, I'm, I don't think I'm in his league. Well, actually, you might be better off than he was. And uh, be thankful for whatever you have and uh, be willing to bless other people. Can I get a good amen? I pick up reading verse 25. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and said, Who can be saved? Well, let me back up. Verse 23. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus said, it is hard. One translation, I believe, is Mark's gospel says, those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of heaven. So it is difficult for people. You can buy a lot with money. Money does give people a sense of independence. It gives people a sense of control. But what money can't do, there's spiritual things you can't acquire through money. And then Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. I understand there's different people that would say that eye of the needle is the needle, the gate of the city. Most commentaries would say that took place after this portion. And literally, it's just a picture of the, the largest animal was the camel in Israel. The smallest opening known to man in that day was a needle's eye. And it's saying, humanly, that's impossible. And without God's help, God's got to touch people's lives. With wealth can come arrogance and, and pride. And there has to be a, a, a humility. And unfortunately, many people that have wealth, it's not until they're brought down through a difficult time that they're willing to come to the Lord and, and see the Lord. It's like one man said, it wasn't until I was knocked down that I was able to look up. And so, um, you know, we, we just need to keep our eyes on the Lord. Verse 25, when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, with God, but with God all things are what? Yeah, with God all things are possible. Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. Now, most people, when you hear that, Peter said, we've left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? You know, Jesus didn't rebuke him. He didn't upbraid him. He didn't say, Peter, just zip it. He didn't say, he just looked at him and said, you know, I acknowledge the fact that you've left everything to follow me. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things. This word renewal is only used twice in the New Testament as I understand it. And one is in Titus 3, 5, a renewal, indiv- individually a renewal. But he's talking about a renewal of the earth, a renewal of all things. When the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So Jesus basically says, your faithfulness now, you're going to receive benefits during the millennial. There are certain millennial benefits. You understand, earth time is just a slice of time. You say, Pastor, you know, earth time, 70, 90, 120, wherever you're at, whatever you're believing for. You know, most, what, people live a certain time, and then they're gone. Do you understand the millennial reigns a 1,000 years, and that's just a slice of time? I know some people say, I got my bucket list. Well, I'm not going to kick the bucket. Can I get a good amen? I'm just going to move on to another place. I do feel that way. I don't have this sense, I've got to get this done before I die. Are you kidding me? When I die, those are the best days of my life. Well, I just thought I'd throw that out there. I know that once you all quit shouting, I'll keep reading here, right? Verse 29, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive 
a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. I think of Oscar Brooks when I read this. He's left houses, siblings, his parents, his son at times, will receive a hundred times as much. What does that mean? Does Oscar have a hundred houses around the world? No, he doesn't have a hundred houses. But I can promise you this, he's got at least a hundred places across the world that if he needed a place to stay, he could find a place to stay. He'll never be without. He'll never be without somebody that wants to help him. I got a card from him yesterday saying we're, we're down here in, I think it was Peru. And he said, it's wintertime down here. And, and um, you know, just thank you, good news, for all that you do for us. You understand that there are there's a tremendous reward for people that are willing to abandon all, give it all, sell out. Give it all. That's what the disciples did, and that's what God calls us to do. Many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. So the kingdom of heaven is a kingdom of reversals. It's an upside-down kingdom. There's people right now that you say, oh, they're the movers and shakers. They're in the technology world. They're the movers and shakers. They may not even be in heaven. No, I'm just, I, I don't want that to be true. I'm just saying it is true, though. And so we live in this upside-down kingdom where people idealize certain, oh, boy, I tell you, I wish I could just touch them. I wish I could be in the same room with them. We've got to realize that God's got people all around this world that soon as the judgment seat of Christ, the people that are very first will be at the back of the line. Those that are at the back of the line on this earth, they will be at the front of the line. We're living... Not for a hundred years. We're living for eternity. So David said, you know, my life is like a hand breath. In other words, he looked at the span of his hand and he said, that's my life on this earth. There's one step between life and death. He realized that my life is short on this earth. So what are we doing? We're living for all eternity. Can I get a good amen? Heaven doesn't base its standards upon the world's standards. It doesn't value certain people. They're important based upon this. No. We put our priority on a kingdom that's never going to run out. Praise God. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you today for this portion of Scripture, Lord. And as we just move through here and we're just reminded of uh, these two accounts, Jesus, how his life was interrupted on two different occasions, but he looked at that as an opportunity of ministry. And Father, I just pray for all of us in this room that we will not just barrel through life and push through life so fast that we fail to recognize opportunities that are in front of us, Lord.